to the Watermark Studio. It's nice to have you all here, you know, come join us today. And big thanks to Lucia for, you know, working tirelessly over the last few weeks trying to make this all happen. Things, gatherings like this is really important because it really allows us to connect, learn and grow. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow speakers, Hayley and Nikki. Um, the tech space is really diverse and really dynamic. And so it's really cool because it sounds like as if we'll be coming at this from a really different perspectives. Okay, so my name's Bettina. I'm the design director and cat herder here at Watermark. <laughs> <laughs> um, I help Dave uh, manage the Auckland studio and also look after the artists. I'm a cross-disciplinary designer and started my career 20 years ago in traditional graphic design, but specifically in the corporate design realm. So what was great about this was the experience that gave me, um, it gave me a really good foundation on branding, comms, as well as business. So fast forward to 2011, I got to the point where I felt like as if I'd learned enough and just really wanted to take the next step in my career. So I bit, up, I bit the bullet and then set up my own design practice. So my first big projects were an app for Telefonica in the UK and um, a website for Trade Me. And after this, I just really fell in love with the digital space, just because it really encouraged me to continuously learn. And plus, I love simplifying the complex. Um, lately, I've been working a lot with small to medium businesses and startups, um, and to help them with their customer experience through branding, UI and UX design. For those of you who are not familiar with our field, that's user experience and user interface design, and as well as comms. So a, probably a better way to explain what I actually do is I'm a translator, I'm a problem solver, and I'm a glorified warrior. So I identify people's problems and challenges, and I figure out solutions to make their life better and easier through design. So alongside design, my passion is in education. This will be throwback for some of you here. I've got some of my ex-students in the audience. <laughs> um, so I've been teaching on and off at AUT for the last 20 years. And now I'm working with Dave and the Watermark team to expand this offering as part of Watermark. And our intention is to nurture and develop the next generation of creative entrepreneurs. And you'll see with the work that I show today, the consistent thread is that I really lean heavily into the people side of my process. So let's rewind back to the, to the 80s. So every weekend I'd visit my grandparents. My grandmother was a high school principal in the Philippines, so whenever I visited them, the back of their room was just a treasure trove of like stationery and school supplies. She'd always give me fresh paper and pencils, and this was the most treasured introduction to technology that I had. She showed me the power of tech and its ability to unlock creativity. So from that moment, my relationship with tech continued to develop. And here are some technologies that have shaped and nurtured my creativity. So to some of you, this might be actual physical, um, physical objects, which is what I grew up with but others might only recognize it as UI icons in your, on your phone. Um, so, as most of the team here in Watermark, I'm medium agnostic. We see technology as a tool, and with the right mindset, it has the capability to bring to get people together and transform lives. But it shouldn't be driving our process. There's a lot of different technologies that are currently being built today, and then these are just a few of them. I personally have a strong interest in blockchain, augmented reality, AR, virtual reality, VR, and now I'm forced into AI, whether I like it or not, and I'm sure most of you are. So, since I have to keep within time, I'll primarily be focusing on AI because there are a lot of questions and concerns surrounding its potential. So out of curiosity, just, I just want to get a straw poll, um, like, of hands. How do you feel about AI? Um, who here is scared of AI? 
Ah, there's a few, yes. <laughs> Worried? Yes. <laughs> Who's interested? Okay, a little bit more. <laughs> Who's super excited about it? Yeah. <laughs> Nikki? And who has absolutely no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, so at least, <laughs> that's good. Um, so for me, this is how I feel about AI. You know, really interested, but you know, I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. So as I was planning this talk, I did what everyone else did and then just fobbed off the responsibility to chat GPT. So for people who are not familiar, this is just a quick demo. And the hilarious thing with this is that it actually took me longer to type up my question than for ChatGPT <laughs> to write it up. So here I just asked it if it can write me a 20-minute 20, 20 structure for a, t a talk on creativity and technology. It's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> it is cheating. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and it even wished me luck in my presentation, which is really, really super <laughs> awesome. <laughs> The thing is, I believe that AI is going to be one of the most significant pieces of technology that will shape our future. Good or bad, we're still yet to find out. So it could, aspect every, um, it could impact every aspect of our lives and none of us will be immune to it. Pandora's box is already open and I'm afraid that this tech isn't really going to go away. So let's have a look at these. What do you think these have in common? Anyone? A job. <laughs> so, at once upon a time, these were all innovations that experienced resistance from the public. And yes, your, our daily ritual for <laughs> coffee also experienced resistance. <laughs> so, back in the 80s, people were actually petrified of using computers. In the 1996 book, Women and Computers, it said that women were afflicted with computer phobia, and that is the fear of touching or damaging the device, and even feeling threatened by it. And look at us, most of us, case A here, like, you know, we do expect to use it every day. So the thing is, I don't think people fear new technology, but what they fear is the loss that it will bring. So, here are a few examples of some of the headlines around AI at the moment. So this is um, from ARC Invest's Big Ideas 2023 report that just got released earlier this year. And then we're looking at here because this is what's relevant to us. So for a graphic designer to create this image, which would take five hours and cost $150 an hour, a generative AI model can now take eight seconds to make it and reduce that cost down to eight cents. So that's $150 down to eight cents. So ironically, the creative industry seems to be the first, first undeceived by AI. So these are a couple of articles that started, that was actually featured last week, how there are some writers in Hollywood that are um, striking, about, um, you know, AI is one component of many. And then you've got IBM who's now pausing hiring. So um, if you asked people a year ago who would be the safest in the AI revolution, no one would have guessed that it would be us that would be the first in the firing line. So after hearing things like this, it's understandable why it's upset the apple cart and a wave of concern is actually washing through the creative community. A lot of artists, their AI could devalue our craft, and with the way the technology is progressing, it might lead to some jobs becoming obsolete. Don't worry, there is a, it's not a doom and gloom, okay? <laughs> so, as a group, and me as a warrior, this is now something that we have to figure out. We have about 30 creatives within Watermark, with vastly different opinions and experience with AI. So we have to approach this topic sensitively and as inclusively as possible. So for me personally, I'm using AI every day and then I'm testing out different software. I don't want it to replace what I do, but I genuinely want to integrate it into my working process. So this prompted me to go through all the jobs that I've worked on and figure out which tasks could be complemented 
or done by AI. So I looked at branding. So at the top I've got the role and then below are the tasks that I actually do in any given project. So most of them can be done by AI. UX design. I still have one there that I can't touch yet, so I'm advocating for the user. <laughs> UI design. I think UI might be one of the first ones to go just because when branding and UX is done, UI is a systems design and it can easily, that's what it would kind of like flourish to do. And then we've got comms as well, which is quite similar. But I do want to caveat that these tasks still require someone to instruct the AI agent to execute it. And this is also where the technology currently stands right now. But AI is developing rapidly, almost on a daily basis, and even the people who are like building it don't really know how, where it's going to go. So for the sake of clarity, there are different types of AI. What I'll be covering tonight is ANI, which is Artificial Narrow Intelligence, not AGI, not ASI. So narrow AI is also known as weak AI, but it's anything but weak. It's incredibly, it's incredibly useful, but it's only designed to do one specific task. So for example, with ChatGPT, it's a language model. With Midjourney, it's an image, generative image model. So they are general in a sense that they learn from a broad range of information, but at the same, and um, a wide range of topics. But they can't contextualize themselves in the world the way we can as people. AGI, on the other hand, the one in the middle, that's the one that everyone's freaking out about. It's able to create things beyond what it's been designed to do, whereas A and, A and I can't do that. So some experts reckon that's about five years away, but um, so we have a little bit of time. <laughs> so going back to my internal audit, it really <coughs> made me think, what can actually keep us relevant? The software and tech, well, I normally work on like say apps and websites. So the software and tech that we make can be deployed globally and instantly at scale. However, even if our products or comms can reach millions of people all at the same time, we're only ever talking to one person at a time, and that person's human. So this led me to the question that I asked myself. What value do we ultimately contribute as humans that can't be replaced by tech? It's a super difficult question to hear, but I almost can't afford not to ask it. So what I'd really like to talk about today is an idea. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this because this is a hot topic right now at the Auckland Studio. That perhaps our greatest flaw, our flaws might be our biggest strengths. So how many of you here have heard of Pythagoras? Yes, I'm sure that you all use Pythagoras' theorem every day. So let me tell you a story about him. So Pythag Pythagoras was a huge help in figuring out the hypotenuse, see exhibit A, of a triangle. He led a group of brilliant mathematicians who believed that harmonics can explain <coughs> the secrets to the universe and how things worked. So at the heart of their research was breaking and analyzing ratios down to its core components to uncover the secret of the universe. So according to the myth, Pythagoras was stuck on a theory. And like most of us, he went for a walk to clear his head. He walked past a blacksmith's shop, a blacksmith, and heard five workers inside, all using hammers to bend the iron. Ding, 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 dong. Ding, 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 dong. That's exactly what it sounded like. As the hammer struck in rhythm, the clang created a beautiful sound. So he burst into the workshop, grabbed all five hammers, hoping to unlock the secret to the sound, and maybe this could get him unstuck with what he was trying to, the problem <coughs> he was trying to solve. So after weeks of measuring and weighing each one, he discovered 
that the first four hammers were actually in perfect harmony with each other because each was an equal ratio to the next. Interestingly, the fifth hammer didn't follow the same rules. So he discarded it because it felt like an imperfection. This one was actually created by Majuli, you can tell because the hammer doesn't look like that. So <laughs> just, we, we still have a bit to go. <laughs> but it turns out that the secret to the entire sound was the fifth hammer, the misfit. It worked precisely because it wasn't perfect. It added texture and depth to the sound that wouldn't have been there otherwise. It was the one that made it special. So the fifth hammer is the one that's not proven, not obvious, and not always encouraged. And the fifth hammer is you. Think of AI as the first four hammers, working as predicted in perfect harmony. But we need that human component to be the fifth hammer, to change it from being this repetitive, monotonous sound and turn it into music. So what I'd like to discuss are three aspects of human nature which I believe are actually relevant to actual creativity. That's our curiosity, our playfulness, and our rebellious streak. So the beauty of AI is that it can learn and process large amounts of data much faster than any of us can. None of us can possibly suck the whole internet into our brains and then process it all at the same time. So one important distinction in the way we work is that even though AI can learn heaps faster, it's not curious and it doesn't question. I'm curious by nature, so I love asking questions and try to learn things that you can't really get from the internet. So the start of my process is normally very grounded in reality. So with every UI project that I do, I have to take into consideration three key things. I have to understand the business, I have to understand the customer needs, and I also have to understand the technology that we'll be using to, create, to communicate with that customer. It's critical to strike a balance between all three of these. So the projects that I work on vary greatly, from beekeeping to home loans, to medical apps, and even a family-run timber mill in Motueka. It's important to understand the business, because each and its stakeholders are all the same. The one thing, that's the one thing I really love about design, is because we're exposed to a whole lot of different industries, and you have to become a mini-expert in each one. So in addition to this, the businesses have a variety of different customers each one with different needs. Since we're creating digital products that could be used anywhere, we have to consider how people in other parts of the world will use the tech as well. So, things like what language do they speak? What devices do they use? What if they're visually in, um, impaired? Things like that. So truly understanding the customer is important. And I don't mean researching in Reddit, because AI can learn from that too. So this is the reason why I travel, to learn about different people and cultures, to gain new perspectives, and expand my understanding of the world. You never know when the information will come in handy. So as creatives, I feel that we have an obligation and responsibility to factor in different people, different cultures, and diverse points of view when we design. I'm not saying that you have to travel to every corner of the world for this, but you can do it closer to home. I'm not, um, I often conduct user interviews, preferably face-to-face, -face, and just listen to people. There's a lot of valuable information that you uncover when you read in between the lines of what people are actually saying. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. So to me, tech is an enabler, the bridge that actually connects us to people. We do quite a bit of R&D here in the studio, as you can see there. We often test drive the latest tech to get a feel for what it can do and what its limits are. 
in order to create the best possible user experience. So having a good understanding also allows us to collaborate more effectively as well as negotiate with the developers and the wider team. So an ounce of practice is generally worth more than a ton of theory. Um, an example of this is the BuzzTech project. I worked with a team to develop an app combining the latest co um, technology with holistic beekeeping methods. The aim is to help beekeepers improve their workflow and protect and look after the well-being of our precious bees. In order to provide the most effective solution, I spend a lot of time with commercial beekeepers operating in both urban and rural environments here in New Zealand. This meant having to pick up beekeeping, getting stung on uh, a couple of occasions, in order to gain the necessary insights in their workflow and fully understanding their pain points. Beekeepers actually have it hard sometimes because they face quite a few challenges in their work. Being outdoors in all sorts of weather conditions is tough. Some of the hives are in extremely remote locations, so internet is dodgy, and they have to work quickly because they need to spend long hours on the road. And they also have reduced visibility while wearing the bee suit. Not to mention, bees are buzzing everywhere. So this is just to give you a sense of what we're dealing with when they're conducting inspections. So I initially designed the app in the comforts of the studio with 24 seven Wi-Fi and <laughs> consistent lighting. So it wasn't until I did my first inspection <coughs> that I realized I couldn't read the text because the font that I chose was the exact same weight as the netting that was really close to my face. <laughs> <laughs> and then I couldn't have lovely subtle colors because as you can see, the way the sunlight would hit my screen like that. I couldn't even see the interface. It needed to be high contrast. And all the nice tiny designer buttons were so hard to use. I think after this you can see me struggling because the touch screen was not as responsive because I'm wearing gloves half the time so I don't get stung because you can see the bee down there. So it's safe to say all this knowledge and newly gained experience really informed the next iteration of my designs. So most beekeepers are actually not big fans of technology. To help with onboarding, we used language that would resonate with them and that's how they spoke. They trusted more because it felt like as if it was made for them, and it was. Now, instead of a chaotic system of handwritten notes and WhatsApp messages, they can conduct inspection within, inspections within 10 minutes, they can treat viruses much quicker, and then allow the company to forecast a year in advance so they've never been able to do that before. So by fully immersing ourselves in the nuances of business, the customer and the tech, it provides us with unique insights that you can't get from the internet. And that's a, it's then that's data that AI won't have because it doesn't have the ability to contextualize itself in the real world. So the next one is AI is instantaneous. It can solve complex problems, create imagery, and even video within seconds. So this is a demo of Runway. All you really need to do is type what you want a video for and it'll automatically generate it. I'm not saying it's perfect because the, the <coughs> sofa was actually looking backwards instead of that way, but you get the gist. <laughs> so both the pro and the con with AI is that we arrive at the answer instantly. The thought of this sounds really enticing, right? As humans, we're super lazy by nature. We're more than happy to outsource our problem solving to super intelligent machines. It may give us the answer straight away, but we don't know how it got there and why it's right. We're just simply operating on blind <coughs> faith. So AI is trained to get better and better, but our leverage is our ability to play and experiment. By failing to do this, we're missing out on the chance to develop our own understanding, gain insights and perhaps even uncover the true problem that we should be solving. When we're creating, our process is not straightforward. It's messy, it's scary, 
and we constantly doubt ourselves because we're venturing into new territory. This means we will make mistakes, and we may even fail. But this gives us the potential to create something that we wouldn't have imagined, maybe even something extraordinary. It's not obvious, but the fuck-ups is where the magic is, and AI doesn't tend to fuck up. <laughs> when I create, I prefer to start with pen and paper. This low barrier method of creating allows us to make mistakes and explore our ideas without the pressure of perfectionism. It also means iterating on the same idea over and over again, each time unintentionally a little different. Perhaps you discover a new little gem, or maybe it just ends up being a dud, but I, still, I bet you still learnt something from it. Jumping straight into the computer, on the other hand, which we think is generally more efficient, it only makes us rush towards getting it done. It doesn't always benefit, and we don't always benefit from that process. Play is an instinctive act modified by intelligence. Play and humour is really critical to my creative process, particularly when I'm experiencing a mental block. Being playful unlocks unexpected solutions and opens up different options that we may not even have before. But it could also end up being the secret sauce. This, things like this are particularly important on a branding project because the purpose is to be distinctive, to differentiate a company or an offering. The watermark brand that you actually see today is the second iteration. I kept producing the same standard logo concepts and got to the point where I was really, really stuck and had to do a complete overhaul. It wasn't bad, it just wasn't anything to write home about. So I ditched the first version and just took some time out to play around with some bits of paper. I started off by creating a grid based on W and M for watermark. And then from there, I created little tiny origami, origami sculptures out of it. And then as I spun it around, there was just something really beautiful in the way the light was hitting the shapes. And that's where the watermark brand system stemmed from. And what, was, what I really liked about this is that it works in both 2D as well as 3D, so it gives the artists room to, room to create with it. So while I was folding paper and moving it around, I was thinking about trying to encapsulate it, or what we're trying to encapsulate in the brand. It had to represent so many different people and so many different personalities with distinctive styles. So instead of a standard logo, we have the atom. Think of it as a Lego block that represents each artist within a watermark. It can work individually, like so, but you can also connect it together to create a pattern. And this is a metaphor for the way that we work together as a team. It's really important to create a modular and flexible system that would accommodate the different types of creators <coughs> that we have in their artistic traits. Each person had to feel like the brand represented them specifically, rather than a single entity that they had to subscribe to. So behind any one successful product is a million mistakes and failures, and I shall have made my fair share of them. But there is a secret to making mistakes, and that's knowing how to learn from them in order to keep moving forward. So with each mistake, you gain valuable insights and knowledge. And what may seem like a mistake today could end up being your breakthrough tomorrow. AI is an amazing tool which can provide us with a perfect solution. But then the thing is, it will only give us what it thinks we need or we want to see. It doesn't have an opinion. Instead, it's an aggregator based on the data it's learned from. It's only as reliable and as effective as the data that it's been given. Although AI can provide us with incredible solutions, don't overlook our unique capacity to challenge. Narrow AI, although advanced, won't do that. It's only capable of executing instructions. 
This is where we currently have the upper hand. It's our ability to ask the right questions, think critically, and therefore challenge assumptions that has the power to create meaningful change. One area that's well overdue for a change is the banking system. If any of you here are in banking, you are well aware of how archaic that system is. This is why Teller decided to challenge the way the home loan industry works. <coughs> Teller is New Zealand's first truly digital home loan pl platform. The vision is to help Kiwis into their dream homes and achieve their financial goals. However, the everyday person is not going to be able to achieve this easily if they have to deal with a big complex system that takes ages to do stuff. And that's really hard to understand. If you've applied for a home loan before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We knew that there was a better way to do things. So I worked with them to develop this product from scratch. We could have just done what other competitors did and simply digitized the old school paperwork system they currently have. However, we, co we conducted in-depth interviews with customers and quickly uncovered their frustrations and true pain points. Although most of these pain points were targeted towards real estate agents, but that's outside the scope of that project. So asking the right questions encouraged us to rethink the customer journey. A lot of companies focus on just optimizing the application form. But the process really starts much earlier than that. So the application form is here. So the process really starts from when the person starts dreaming about buying the home. And that could be years before they even start applying. So with a significant lack of knowledge from the customer's end, we also had to rethink the education piece for this project. Information wasn't being communicated effectively, and it wasn't reaching the people who needed it most, aka first home buyers. We went through all the data, existing data, online and offline. We needed to think critically in order to filter out the excess because there was so much information, and deliver the most important information in a way that's easy to understand so that the customers can make the best decisions for themselves. We strategically designed a simple, easy, and enjoyable experience where the customer was presented with information in an as-needed basis in whatever touch point suited them the best. We challenged the assumption that home loans had to be hard and takes ages. Tell us goal to reduce a month-long process down to two days, and they are getting there. So by rethinking the process, I think the quickest customer application so far is 31 minutes. Nadia might be able to confirm that for me. <laughs> Which normally takes an average of 10 days because people are running around having to get everything together. And also for a bank approval, which optimistically takes eight days, they were able to get one of the approvals in one day because the paperwork was just so spot on. So as creators, we have to resist the temptation of mimicry and blindly following what other people are doing. Going against the grain isn't always encouraged. But if you go with the status quo, then you are running the risk of being replaced by AI. AI is causing real fear and panic for some because it challenges us to rethink the way we operate in the world. The thing is, we can't expect AI to fit in our own paradigm, in our existing paradigm. It's time to look beyond our current situation and the way we currently do things. We have to create new rules and redefine the ball game. In whatever industry you're in, it's not just limited to the creative industry. It's better to follow your own path, however imperfectly, than to follow someone else's perfectly. So contrary to popular belief, I don't think AI is going to let us retire early. So for those of you who have already started booking plane tickets, you might just want to rethink that. It's quite the opposite. It will require us to be more involved than ever before. And what has always helped refine new technology 
is to have diverse range of voices to help guide it. So we regularly have interns working with us. And the best thing that we can do with it for them right now in the creatives within our collective is to equip them with, the, um, with foundational design principles and help them discover their unique identities so that they can keep remaining competitive in whatever new technology they're faced with. I was actually asked the other day by one of my ex-students, what should a junior designer do venturing into this new future? I've already been thinking about this for quite some time already because Midjourney and some of the generative image models are doing a really, really decent job. My answer is be the fifth hammer. Don't just be any hammer, be the fifth hammer. It has to be unique to elevate that sound from being just noise to creating music. And think about it, a hammer has the ability to both break things as well as build things. And the best way to predict the future is just to build it. Thanks.